Good morning, Olivia. Thank you for having us again. This is Heidi Winkowski, Vice President of Sonosim. Uh, we will be able to answer all questions during and after the presentation if you'd like to message us in the chat. And for attendees of today's webinar, you can access a complimentary trial of Sonosim if you email us at info at sonosim.com. And with that, we'll get started. Dr. Savitsky is a professor of emergency medicine and pediatric emergency medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. As the founder and CEO of Sonosim, Dr. Savitsky is a pioneer of ultrasound education. Great, wonderful to be with everyone this morning and really excited to talk about how to successfully deliver ultrasound simulation in the era of COVID and beyond. And this is part two of our two-part series and we are with you last week and we're going to go a lot deeper into many of the elements that we touched on in our first session. So here we're really going to look at the principles behind the Sonos ultrasound training solutions. What are the foundational pillars and why do they exist? And we're going to really dig into knowledge acquisition and the Sonos and courses and how they're constructed because obviously it's very, very important to have background knowledge. The second thing you need to really have if you want to be competent in ultrasound is the ability to acquire an image and interpret that image. And that's the Sonos simulator. And we'll get into a variety of different cases that whether you're a simulation center director or a sonography program director, really get into the breadth of Sonos simulator cases and how they are organized. And then most importantly, at the end of the day, when you have background knowledge, you acquire an image and you interpret an image, what we really care about is how do you actually integrate that ultrasound finding into the medical decision-making? How does it drive uh, the decision-making forward and ultimately help patient care? Another uh, application that we're really going to discuss and get into is how Sonosim facilitates ultrasound-guided procedure training in a, in a very unique way. And then importantly for administrators, simulation center directors, uh, DMS program directors, it's really important to track the performance of your users, provide feedback, and create an e-portfolio for uh, learners. The other parts of today's session, we're going to have a resuscitative transesophageal echocardiography, TEE preview. So this is the latest Sonosim innovation, and it's literally showing you the ability and providing learners the ability to acquire a lot of the foundational principles and psychomotor skills required to perform transesophageal echocardiography or TEE using a laptop-based simulation using real patient pathology. My colleague, Eric Siri is gonna provide a Sonosim live scan preview of our dynamic scenarios and several more features. And this latest innovation really takes our current ability to create over a million different case combinations with Sonosim Case Builder and create dynamic scenarios. So physiological states will change in relation to how a patient or how the learner responds to a patient. So you can change the patient's heart rate, change the patient's respiratory rate. So a variety of physiological parameters will be under your control to manage based on how a learner proceeds through a case. So very excited about that. And then we're gonna have a Sonosim user and a partner that we collaborate with and facilitate their educational efforts. Shay Dempsey from Shenandoah University is gonna talk a little bit about how Sonosim has helped him and his colleagues facilitate PA training at Shenandoah University uh, during the era of COVID. And that should leave some nice, uh, nice opportunity to do some questions and answers at the conclusion. Once again, just coming back to the real core fundamental principle that ultrasound is, is a Operator dependent technology, meaning it's only as good as the user's ability to acquire an image, interpret an image, and apply that uh, towards medical decision making. So, once again, we're going to go through some of some courses, and I'm going to take you through uh, that in greater detail, as well as our assessment, both in module and mastery tests. We're going to get into the Sona simulator itself and really look at whether you're a simulation center that has pediatricians, critical care doctors, emergency medicine, general surgery, OBGYN, sports medicine, nursing students, PA students, whatever type of student you have rotating through your facility, sonography students, if you're a sonography program, the, uh, the ability of the Sona simulator provide real pathological cases that people can access remotely as well as live for purposes of image acquisition and image interpretation training. The 
Sonosim live scan technology, my colleague Eric Siri will talk about. Once again, he'll talk about the, uh, the dynamic scenarios and how this is an advance uh, over our current ability to use case builder to create millions of case combinations and use either a person or a mannequin to uh, create scenarios. And now we'll be having the ability to create dynamic scenarios in which the physiological state of the patient can be changed. We're going to talk about our ultrasound guided procedure training using the Sonos simulator and the cognitive task training construct. And once again, uh, the cognitive task training construct is providing people declarative knowledge that they get through the Sonos courses, that they get the background knowledge about procedures, contraindications, understand the anatomy, regional anatomy, sonographic anatomy, learn about imaging tips and pitfalls. Then they uh, acquire the procedural knowledge by actually going through the Soma Simulator and working through a series of cases featuring real patient anatomy. So they get a variety of different anatomical variation that allows them to develop their visiomotor, visiospatial, psychomotor skills. And then they get the opportunity to apply that either in a simulation center on a phantom with a real ultrasound machine or potentially as a proctored procedure on a real patient. And then importantly, the Sonosim mobile app provides the opportunity for just-in-time refresher training at a patient's bedside, potentially either before you go in, uh, just as a reminder, perhaps on some key anatomical areas and some key anatomical landmarks that potentially um, would benefit someone from getting updated upon. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over and we're going to provide you insight as a user what it would be like to enter into Sonosim, uh, where you enter your username, your password, and this uh, very shortly, what you will see is the environment you will enter into, whether you're an administrator or a student. So we'll give you that opportunity to have that experience right now. All right, so now you've logged in and you would log in as a system administrator or as an individual learner. You land on your Sonosim dashboard. And the first thing that we were going to talk about, we were going to talk about the declarative knowledge piece. So here we're going to dive into our Sonosim course library. And the important thing that you'll see here when you look into the course library is you'll see the organizational construct. So as a director of a simulation center, uh, you have the ability to provide anatomy and physiology courses. So this is the basics, provide the real foundational building blocks. And they're organized in a way that basically is organ specific. So it's perfect for medical school education, or if you're a simulation center uh, director or even a sonography program director that wants to really build a strong foundational knowledge, deep understanding and knowledge of ultrasound, that could be a great uh, foundation to provide. The core clinical series, these are for the most part very relevant to your point of care ultrasound practitioners, and they appeal to a variety of different pulmonary care ultrasound applications, whether it's emergency medicine, critical care, general surgery, OBGYN, pediatrics, internal medicine, or family medicine. And these are point of care topics, including the RUSH protocol, the EFAS protocol. And here we get into our advanced clinical series. So this is a, a very in-depth series of advanced topics, for the most part, highly relevant to sonography programs, and then also to point of care practitioners that are at a fellowship level, whether it's a point of care ultrasound fellowship level in critical care or emergency medicine, or maybe OBGYN, or an echocardiography a fellow. This is the type of level of instruction that you would have. And then this is, as we talked about, these are our cognitive task training modules that are procedure modules that really instruct people on a variety of topics uh, in terms of ultrasound guided procedures. So it really provides people a breadth of education. So I'm going to follow just one uh, line of thinking and we'll take a take you through from a learner's perspective. So let's say you wanted to learn about ultrasound guided uh, pericardiosynthesis. We'll dig into the course and all of the Sonosim courses in general have the same course construct. So right now, whether you have a, a mobile application such as a mobile phone, an iPad, or a uh, Android device or a laptop computer, you will log into the course and the course goes through in a screen by screen format. You can control the screen by moving forward here. Um, it goes through your standard disclosures, the CME information, and then the organization of the course. There's a course introduction. It gets into regional anatomy where you can actually really learn um, about the heart, uh, the different structures. Then it transitions into sonographic anatomy, 
where you actually um, develop an appreciation of how the, uh, the sonographic features apply. There's a script, um, there's playback, different playback speeds, there's audio narration, should you choose to have that. And essentially it goes through the sonographic anatomy that would be most relevant uh, for that particular topic. So here you're looking to learn about pericardial effusion. So there'll be a series of whether still images or ultrasound clips, all of them narrated that go through a variety of different topics as they relate to pericardial effusions, pericardiocentesis. Then we get into how do you prepare for a procedure? So what is your pre-procedure considerations, your supply lists? What type of transducers do you want to select? The pros and cons of the different types of transducers? a little bit about performing a survey scan and uh, an in-depth discussion about infection prevention and sterile technique and the importance of that. Then you actually transition into pr procedure steps where it takes you through how to go through confirming your uh, transducer orientation, talking about the application uh, of local anesthetic. And once again, combination of both video as, and still images as it's relevant to the topic. We talk about real-time image guidance. Uh, we talk about different windows in terms of different windows that you can use to perform the procedure, uh, the subcostal, the apical. We talk about uh, needle localization, and we go through several case studies, and these are all real patients and real patient scenarios, and we talk through uh, how ultrasound-guided pericardiosynthesis made a difference. Really importantly, at the end of each of these lessons, there's a knowledge check. And what the knowledge check does is during the course itself, it prompts the user to go through, read a question, look at an image, and basically apply their knowledge to medical decision making. And when you select a choice, if you selected the correct choice, you get instant feedback and the rationale for that. If you make an incorrect choice, it lets you know what the uh, correct choice is and what the rationale for that would be. These, you get instant feedback. These are called in-module um, tests or in-module questions. You go through technical tips and pitfalls. We get into an in-depth discussion of procedure complications. And then importantly, when you get to the end, uh, you get your mastery test. So this is what gets recorded here. You do not get any feedback. You go through, in general, it's about 20 questions. You need 75% or higher to uh, pass a course. And this is ultimately what winds up becoming graded within your Sonosim performance tracking interface. So this is what your system administrator uh, sees. So once again, this part was the declarative knowledge. So this is how your learners, whether you're a sonography program director, a simulation center director, or a ultrasound fellowship director, this is how your learners are gonna acquire the background knowledge. So they all get a foundation of knowledge and you can track and see how they all perform. The second place we're gonna transition into, right now we've transitioned into the Sono Simulator. And once again, the Sono Simulator, this is the interface, same interface, laptop based. And what I'm scrolling through here is just a variety of different topics. And what I'm gonna take you through and talk through very quickly is Think of all the different users that come through a simulation center. So you could have potentially a beginning learner, uh, a novice uh, learner. And what they do is they get the probe that you can see here um, that I'm holding in my hand. They can scan on a scan pad or they can simply uh, align the probe with a simple calibration on the screen in front of them. And it's a mo momentary process. And then they can pick a variety of different topics. All of these cases correlate with the course that they took. So if I took the pericardiosynthesis course, I could come down and I'll show you shortly, I will load a series of pericardiosynthesis cases. So if you, let's say you have beginning learners that don't know anything about ultrasound, what you can do is you can go through uh, our Sonosim skill box. And what our skill box is, is it assumes you've got no background knowledge in ultrasound uh, from a anatomy perspective but you go through the case history, it says, please examine the shape uh, within this box using sonography. So I am moving my probe around and I can see I'm intermittently encountering a structure. So as I scroll through here, I'm using the Sono simulator and I acquire what looks like an X. I can use my layers button and I can see that the structure within the box is truly an X. 
And then I start to develop that visio-spatial, visio-motor, the ability to kind of recreate that three-dimensional space and understand what I'm looking at. Um, I develop that ability and I can challenge myself. I also have prompts. If I didn't know how to get this structure or these parastructures in long axis, I can use my probe guide. And my probe guide allows me to get um, the structures in long axis. And when I do, the probe guide turns green and lets me know that's the case. Uh, if I didn't know how to get the structures in short axis, I can align here and that's the structures in short axis. I have a virtual instructor that I can play here and there'll be a findings video that basically a virtual instructor will take you through and narrate exactly what it is that you uh, would be seeing. So this is your virtual tutor that you have 24-7 uh, access to. So a very, very important tool. And then there's a variety of other interfaces here that uh, are modifiable based on just changing depth, changing gain, essentially having this function uh, very similar to um, how a real ultrasound interface functions. So the Sonosum skill box allows the user to really develop a basic uh, knowledge. So it's perfect for the beginner user. Let's say you have emergency medicine uh, residents rotating through your uh, simulation center, or you need to have you know, uh, PAs that are uh, specializing or MPs that are specializing. One of the more common protocols is the EFAST protocol. So here I can load a case and we'll just show you the, the breadth of the Sonos simulator in terms of how it teaches image acquisition and image interpretation. So a 21 year old with a gunshot wound with shortness of breath, gunshot wound to the left chest, you can see the patient's hypotensive and tachycardic. So you can use the Sonos simulator to scan through. You can remove layers um, from the body and really get an appreciation of how the probe is moving and interacting and how it corresponds with underlying anatomy. You can keep the layers button on. Here, I'm gonna go into a suprapubic view and uh, move in and see that there's no fluid in the suprapubic area. I can move to the left upper quadrant. Once again, you can change the, uh, the angle of the body so you can see where the probe is. Nothing going on in the left upper quadrant, so I'm not really finding why this person's hypotensive. I can take a quick look in the subcostal area. I can see that they're tachycardic, but no pericardial fluid. Here I look into the right chest, um, and I can see lung sliding. I don't see any evidence of a pneumothorax. Here I come on over to the left chest, and boom. So here I can see some B lines and I see anechoic fluid here. So this most likely represents hemothorax. So the patient probably has a hemothorax uh, on the right chest. And this is the probably most apical or highest level because I can see uh, a transition between lung movement and the fluid. So this is a, a nice example of left-sided hemothorax in a trauma patient. And, and once again, explains essentially uh, what the pathology is and what the next step would be, which potentially would be uh, a chest tube to uh, relieve the patient's physiology, which is compromised. The next scenario you might encounter is you may have an internal medicine uh, rotator uh, through your ultrasound training facility, or you may have a family practitioner or a critical care person that wants to learn about cardiology or learn about the heart. So a little bit about uh, the cardiac training. So this is an example of an advanced case. And it's an advanced case because here you're asking the user, it's a 65-year-old patient with a history of coronary disease with dyspnea, and you essentially want them to look for valvular regurgitation. So that's a, a really complicated um, or advanced application that requires some specialized training. Here I actually look, and I'm looking at the parasternal long axis view. I didn't know how to get that once again. Um, I can use my probe guide and I can ask for my parasternal long axis view. And if I align to that, um, I will get uh, the optimal view. And um, you can see right here that when I actually acquire that view, probe turns green and I get what our experts think is, a, is the optimal view. Here I can see a really dilated left ventricle with not a lot of movement. I apply Doppler, I apply color flow Doppler the Doppler gate uh, loads, and here I can see there's a lot of regurgitation. You see this blue mitral regurgitation jet coming back into the atrium. I see the vena contracta is eight millimeters. One of the functions that we have is we've got calipers. So here, the vena contracta measurement, I saw it was eight millimeters. So I can actually enter that value um, of eight in. And once it's entered in, 
I can actually use that information and have it transition over into our worksheet. And our cardiac worksheet will allow us to, uh, to make that calculation. So once it's entered in here, I can save that, uh, save that information. I can unfreeze and I can come back and reference it as part of our worksheet. So it's a really, really powerful tool that allows uh, advanced users to understand how to perform ultrasound, how to use Doppler, color flow Doppler, pulse wave Doppler. You can use a worksheet here and users can understand how valvular regurgitation is measured and specifically uh, mitral regurgitation. You can see here the vena contractor was eight millimeters, so it meets the criteria for severe mitral regurgitation. And uh, this provides the ability for learners to learn um, on a case-by-case -case basis using real pathology. They can enter a different window. So you're literally looking at the same case, but here you're using an apical window. So I have to use the same exact hand movements to get a nice uh, apical four chamber or apical five chamber view. I can alternatively use a subcostal uh, view. So I move over here. I can see that of, of the views, the subcostal view is, um, is limited um, of the three. You can look at the proximal IVC here, which I suspect would be, um, would be dilated um, in this person who has very, very uh, compromised uh, left ventricular function. So here I see a, a very distended um, inferior vena cava over 2.1 centimeters with less than 50% collapse. So this is consistent with a right atrial pressure probably of 15 to 20. And you can even uh, perform a suprasternal view, which is an advanced view uh, that is not taught in the earlier modules. So, so once again, this is an example of using a advanced module to really teach some advanced, uh, advanced techniques uh, to a more demanding audience uh, that wants higher level education. That's an example of the cardiology components. Let's say you have an OBGYN resident rotating through your simulation center and they want to learn about obstetrics cases. So same thing, you can use the Sonos simulator to access real pathology. So here I will pull up an OBGYN case. It's a 30 year old G2P1 who presents with three days of pelvic pain. So here we're just going to go into a trans abdominal view. We're just going to look at the bladder. We rotate, uh, we can see the uterus here. In the uterus, um, I can see what looks like uh, potentially a yolk sac. I can move a little bit higher and uh, move the transducer up a little bit, and I'm gonna move and transition up to a uterine body view. So here I can zoom in a little bit, and I see what looks like a flicker of cardiac activity, but it's really, really difficult to see. Um, you can use this to view the fundus as well, the right adnexa, the left adnexa. So in the fundus view, you can actually see that there's a flicker of cardiac activity. So this looks like a viable fetus. I can use my calipers. And remember, uh, our calipers here, because we're looking at OBGYN pathology, I can use a crown rump length measurement. And uh, that actually, I think, is the yolk sac. So I am going to just measure up to here. And this looks like an eight-week IUP uh, with a viable um, a viable heart rate. You can subsequently transition to using this for transvaginal ultrasound. So it's the same case, but scan from a transvaginal perspective. And you can see that the advantage of doing transvaginal sonography is here I can see a really well-defined yolk sac. As I fan, I see the fetus that we saw with a viable heartbeat, and I can actually see and make out the amniotic sac here, and um, I have a much better appreciation that uh, this is the yolk sac, this is the fetus if I want, and that's the viable um, heartbeat of, of a viable fetus. And here, once again, I can confirm just because I have a, a little better imagery here um, that the crown rump plank is right around where we measured previously, right around eight weeks. So just another application for another a diverse user set. Other types of users that may uh, come in to your, your facility and require potentially you know, alternative pathology, people may want to come in and look at uh, abdominal complaints, whether it be a general surgeon, internal medicine, emergency medicine. 
So they may want to come in and, and learn about intra-abdominal pathology. So maybe a patient that comes in with uh, right upper quadrant pain or left upper quadrant pain. So let's take a look at this person. Um, this is another case, 58-year-old female, two days of right upper quadrant pain. When you start scanning through the right upper quadrant, you immediately see a very, very descendant gallbladder. You see a hyperechoic structure here with some acoustic shadowing, and then you see another hyperechoic structure right here, a little harder to see at the gallbladder neck. So this looks like a gallbladder stone right at the gallbladder neck and one a little bit higher. So you really can see the, um, the spectrum of cases. And then most importantly, when you work and encounter a variety of different users, like you would in a simulation center, that you need to provide education. The breadth of the thousands of cases that are provided is really powerful. Uh, if you had pediatric uh, practitioners that wanted to learn pediatric ultrasonography or pediatric critical care fellows, uh, our latest module here, it's a 10 day old with a 32 week ex preemie date female who exhibits decreased activity in feeding. You can use ultrasound and perform cranial um, ultrasonography looking at the brain through the anterior fontanelle. And here, importantly, uh, you do have a variety of different probe guides that correspond with different coronal planes that are standard when you do fetal neurosonography and you're able to see the ventricles, uh, you're able to rotate into a sagittal plane and take a look at the thalami, the brainstem, uh, the anterior posterior horns, the corpus callosum, so a variety of different anatomical areas that you're able to appreciate. And then I'll close out with you know, so much of ultrasound now is is focused on musculoskeletal uh, or MSK applications. And here we'll just show a simple example of ultrasound and how it actually can be applied for teaching your sports medicine, orthopedic, emergency medicine practitioners. So we'll just load up a case here. And this first case is a 30 year old who presents um, after a fall with left elbow pain. So here we actually provide radiographs. If you did not want to have the radiographs, you could have them taken away, uh, whichever your preference. Here, I'm going to leave them up. So this is someone who presents with left elbow pain. And when we start to ultrasound them, uh, we can see the radio head here. And you can see the distal aspect of the humerus. And then when you're actually looking at the radio head, the interesting thing here is you see this big hemarthrosis. So you see a big effusion. So even though you don't see a fracture here, you see that the person's got uh, an effusion in the, right around the radio uh, capitellar uh, region. So that is most consistent with an occult fracture, even though you can't see one. So what we're transitioning out of here is we're going to transition out of the Soma simulator, and we're going to transition back into our dashboard and talk a little bit about uh, what we've just covered. So what we've just covered is the ability for a learner to acquire didactic knowledge, and we've shown the ability to acquire image acquisition and image interpretation skills and ability. And once again, the Sonosim live scan is how you apply those. And I'm going to talk about Sonosim performance tracker and how that is constructed. All right, so what we've transitioned to here is the Sonosim performance tracker dashboard. And this is a really, really important tool. So as an administrator at a simulation center or any ultrasound training program or sonography program, you're really going to be looking to manage your students. So this allows you to look at your students through a radio view, table view, run reports, provide feedback on a variety of different images that are saved. There's a curriculum mapping uh, feature that allows you to select based on what your user is using. Um, based on their specialty or whatever their background is. And then you can pre-select and pick what type of user and you can construct a curriculum, print it and provide it uh, to your user group. So a really, really uh, powerful tool that essentially allows you to customize uh, your uh, end user. There's a variety of different module assignments, and this is what I really wanted to focus on. So remember we talked about uh, someone took the course, it was a pericardiocentesis course, and they wanted to learn how to do ultrasound-guided pericardiocentesis. At the end of concluding their course, 
what they get is a sample assignment. And what the sample assignment does is it goes through and it tasks the user. It tasks the user to perform a variety of different functions. Um, after passing the course, you ask people to get to the parasternal window, the apical window, subcostal window, and perform a variety of different tasks, whether it's looking at structures in short axis or long axis, and at Hello? the end of the day, um, making sure that they could actually uh, execute a procedure. They would go to the soma simulator, which you're seeing up again. They would go to the pericardiosynthesis module. So they would go to procedures. They would select pericardiosynthesis from their choices. They would load a case uh, from the pericardiosynthesis library. And then they would allow it to load and they would use the sample assignments. And in this case, this is a 66 year old male who just had an endocardial uh, biopsy and he presents with shortness of breath. Here, um, increase my gain a little bit so I can see things a little bit better. And it's really clear this person has, you know, a, a potentially hemodynamically significant pericardial effusion. Uh, you can look and you'd be asked to look in your sample assignment through a variety of different windows and uh, potentially save your images for review. And then you're asked to actually do the procedure. So here I'm going to do a pericardiosynthesis. And uh, this is where you develop your hand-eye coordination. You can select if you are a beginner or advanced user. So I'm going to click advanced. And I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to center my needle. And I'm just moving my needle uh, through the keypad that I'm using. I'm going to center my needle where I would want. I'm gonna change my angle of entry, which you can see here to about 50 degrees. And then I'm gonna fan here so I can walk my needle uh, into the correct anatomical place. So I'm advancing my needle and right here, I see the needle right on the tip of the screen. I fan away, it goes away. I'm gonna do what's called walking your needle in. So I'm walking my needle in. And at this point, I am in the pericardial space. I'm gonna rotate into a long axis here. And here I see my needle right there. And I'm actually going to advance my needle a little bit more here, 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 right? And I feel like I'm in a good place. And this is where we have our automated assessment powered by AI. So we use AI to assess that you've successfully aspirated fluid from the pericardial space. And I can try again. So this is a really nice example and a nice segue into Sonosim Performance Tracker, automated assessment powered by AI, and how you have just seen someone go through a course, go through a sample assignment to, to task someone to do certain features, and they use the Sonos Simulator to be able to execute, develop the ability to acquire an image, interpret an image, and be able to ultimately do an ultrasound-guided procedure and get real-time feedback without necessarily needing an instructor over their shoulder. So uh, what we're transitioning into now is actually a preview of our resuscitative TEE module. So once again, this is using a laptop-based simulator to teach how to do resuscitative TEE. So patients that come in in cardiac arrest, uh, where you can perform transesophageal echocardiography in an emergent uh, basis, typically in an intubated patient, and really uh, understand uh, why they're arresting and then hopefully be able to optimize their outcomes. So. Just showing you really quickly, uh, you have the ability to toggle between uh, a variety of different uh, body layers so you can remove organs. I'm gonna remove uh, a fair amount of anatomy here just so we can get an understanding of how the simulator works. So here you can use a variety of different controls um, to withdraw or advance the uh, transducer. So this is done by keypads and by toggles and by controls or by actually manipulating the probe itself. So you can see here, this is turning the transducer to the right and left. You can see how those are uh, toggled and controlled. You can flex or extend. And when you flex or extend, the corresponding knobs on the TE handle will change in, a, in, in the same way they would do on commercially manufactured TE probes. You can flex the transducer uh, by using the smaller knob, which is how TE probes traditionally uh, are operated. And what we're gonna do right now is we'll toggle the, uh, the layers back on to the model. And we're gonna demonstrate a little bit of how the functions and the controls work. So as I advance, so I'm gonna advance the TE probe down into 
a window here that I'd be anticipating to be able to see pathology or regular anatomy. So I'm going to advance to an appropriate level uh, that I would expect to see a four chamber view. So this is what's called a mid esophageal position. And I can rotate the transducer here till I get what looks like a four chamber view here of the heart looking at it posteriorly. And one of the really key features is changing Im imaging planes. So from a mid esophageal position, I can see four chamber view. I change my imaging plane. So if you keep an eye here on the plane of the transducer, it's going to rotate and you can rotate it uh, about 90 degrees. And when it gets to 90 degrees, you'll get a two chamber view uh, of the left atrium and the left ventricle. You rotate it a little bit more. And at this point, you get the three chamber view. So a really, really uh, intuitive way of understanding the psychomotor skills that are required to perform transesophageal echocardiography, a lot of ability to understand probe movement and ultimately how to uh, access a variety of different patients with different pathology to learn the principles of resuscitative TEE uh, in a laptop-based environment before you potentially come into a skill lab and try to perform it on a, you know, potentially a mannequin-based uh, simulation solution. So really uh, preps users so they can come in and also be able to execute uh, proctor exams and then most importantly have access to a variety of different pathology. So I'm going to transition at this point from talking about the SOMA simulator, and we're going to move into a little discussion of SOMA Sim Performance Tracker with AI, and then we'll transition into our next sequence. Thank you. So we're back. So we've covered a lot of ground. And importantly here, uh, the SOMA Sim Performance Tracker, once again, the value of which uh, can't be overstated in the sense of it provides you with really, really powerful tools. And the the element that we're most excited about, and it's the newest application that we've developed, is automated assessment powered by AI. So once again, it's the ability for you to provide sample assignments, which are pre-populated, that make sure the learners go through each course and they're able to execute the acquisition, interpretation, or procedure skills that are most important or relevant to the course that they just completed. Once they've done that, what uh, automated assessment powered by AI does is it makes sure that that assignment is done in an acceptable, unacceptable, or indeterminate uh, fashion based on the quality of the image that has been saved. And that's done and graded automatically. So you as an instructor or a teacher can really uh, use your time to focus on the images that were suboptimal and um, just be much, much more efficient uh, with your time and your resources. So really, really excited about this latest feature. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to transition to my colleague, Eric Siri, who's going to talk about some some live scan and the new dynamic scenario functionality. So I appreciate uh, you spending a few minutes learning about uh, the topics that we've discussed. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Siri. I'm a product manager here at Sonosim. Uh, today, I'm going to walk you through an example of how you can use Sonosim live scan with Case Builder to create dynamic simulations that are going to teach your learners how to integrate medical findings into their decision making. First, we'll go into Case Builder to build our case. Uh, as you can see here, we can select from a variety of different templates. And for this example, we're going to build an EFAST case. Uh, our patient is going to be presenting with shortness of breath, an elevated heart rate of 160 beats per minute, a respiratory rate of 28 breaths per minute, and O2 saturation of 88% on room air following a gunshot wound. Uh, the patient undergoes a primary and secondary survey and has an isolated gunshot wound to the right chest, and so an EFAST is ordered. I'm going to start with the right chest, and as you can see, there's a variety of different data sets to choose from. Uh, with Case Builder, you can create millions of unique training scenarios for your learners. Uh, for this case, I want to import a pneumothorax into the right chest, so I can go ahead and search that there, and all the pneumothorax cases will show up. I can watch this clip to see what the ultrasound imagery looks like, and then I can integrate it into the right chest window. And then I simply repeat this process to keep building out the other ultrasound windows, or I can also import a pre-made template if I want to do that as well. So jumping ahead a little bit here, I've gone ahead and added all the other windows to my EFAST case. As you can see, I've also added a patient history along with vitals. 
We're now ready to run the dynamic simulation in the Sonos simulator and go through the EFAS protocol. Now I say dynamic simulation because you can vary the direction of the scenario based on the learner's actions. And here's how you do that. So taking a look at the right chest, it looks like there is no lung sliding. Let's turn on M mode to confirm that. And yeah, when we turn on M mode, you can see the barcode sign here. And we can determine that this is a pneumothorax. All the other EFAS windows were negative. So as a learner, I'm going to make a diagnosis of a likely tension pneumothorax and ask for an immediate chest tube to be inserted into the right chest. Now, shortly after the chest tube is inserted, the patient's respiratory rate improves to 14 breaths per minute. The heart rate decreases to 100 beats per minute and a repeat assessment demonstrates resolution of the pneumothorax. This patient's tension pneumothorax was successfully identified with ultrasound and managed. See, as you can see, SonarSim LiveScan with Case Builder is a very powerful tool for creating these valuable dynamic simulation experiences. So now let's take a look under the hood and see how this dynamic simulation was executed. Now, as you recall, we asked for an immediate placement of a right-sided chest tube to resolve the patient's tension pneumothorax, and we did that. We saw that the respiratory rate went down. You can actually control the patient's physiological response to the intervention with Sonus and LiveScan. So in this case, we adjusted the respiratory rate. Uh, we didn't show the heart rate, but you can adjust that too, as you're watching right now on the screen, so that when you do a repeat EFAS, you can see what happens as a result of what the learner asked for in the simulation. And then in addition to this, Sonosim will be releasing an additional feature that enables varying the pathological ultrasound findings to correspond to the physiological state of the patient. So in this case, you'd be able to switch out the window for one that has lung sliding again. These dynamic simulation capabilities will begin to roll out as of July 2021 and will be updated over the rest of the year. And finally, we're really excited to announce that Sonosim LiveScan will have an enhanced UI UX design in response to client requests that we have gotten to have the interface more closely match a real ultrasound machine screen. Now, Sonosim LiveScan with Case Builder will look and feel like a real ultrasound machine and deliver the ability to further immerse your learners in the scenario that you have designed for them. Great, and really appreciate the time that we've had together to discuss all the topics that we've covered. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to transition to Shay Dempsey to talk a little bit about how Sonosim is helping him provide a large group of PA students ultrasound education. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Che Dempsey and I am a PA. I teach at Shenandoah University and I also work clinically um, at a critical access hospital in the emergency department. Um, I've been practicing for quite a while now and as well as teaching. I teach, at, like I said, at Shenandoah University in our PA program and have been teaching bedside point of care ultrasound for a number of years. Um, we are in our third year now of using the Sonosim curriculum and technology for um, our PA students in their curriculum. Prior to that, we had tried to introduce um, some ultrasound training, but it's really difficult trying to get everyone together, having only a few uh, machines for people to rotate on um, and teach the basics along with additional skills all at once. So with the Sonosim training um, and technology, we've been able to create an entire course that students go through um, that starts with the basics and fundamentals of ultrasound and progresses all the way up into uh, procedures, focused exams, anatomy scans, um, and so forth. We're then able to take what they've learned in the simulation environment and bring that into actual real settings with students practicing on each other and with real patients on actual ultrasound machines. Um, like I said, we started using Sonosim. We're in our third year now. So we started doing this pre-COVID. So this class that we've created has actually been completely online prior to COVID. So we were very fortunate in using this course as we were set up very well to transition. Actually, nothing about the program has changed. Um, the courses are going exactly as they would prior to COVID as they are post COVID and during COVID. So our students had a seamless transition um, with the ultrasound curriculum um, from how they were doing things before COVID and afterwards. Now, I will say we have increased our number of students that we are 
um, using or allowing into our classroom uh, because they have not been able to take other classes as easily. So um, since COVID, uh, we were initially, we were a program of about 60 students per class. We offer this as an elective. And so we've been having about 20 students um, each year that take this course. And this year we're going up just over 30 uh, because students aren't able to take other electives as easily um, given the online nature that the courses need to be. Um, so it's been really beneficial. We get lots of really good feedback from our students. Um, we do this in our uh, PA students um, in their first year. So they're doing this during their didactic year. Um, I do have one student that is taking it during their clinical year. Um, I think either of those are appropriate. However, the students that are doing it in their didactic year feel like they have a really good foundation of ultrasound once they go on to clinicals. Um, I've gotten really good feedback from preceptors saying your students come into clinicals with lots of good knowledge. They know the terminology. They know the steps of what to look for. They know how to measure things appropriately using ultrasound and with ultrasound becoming so much more readily available at the bedside in ICUs, emergency departments, uh, med surge areas, and even outpatient clinics like urgent cares and orthopedic offices. It's really a skill that uh, we feel like our students need to have when they're entering the workforce so that they can go in there with all the information that they need. So I would say, like I said, we're in our third year right now and we have uh, lots of positive interactions with it. Our students feel very comfortable with it. It's easy to navigate. Um, I tell the students, spend 30 minutes with it because they seem overwhelmed at first. How am I gonna use this new technology? Okay, uh, thank you, Shay. Um, and that concludes our presentation for today. Um, I want to open up now to question and answers. Um, and I can, I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Dr. Savitsky is here to answer them. <laughs> 